This is Ham College, episode 45 for September 30th, 2018. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. See how you can make the most out of contest season with ICOM. And by hamstudy.org, a great way to study for your next license exam. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And it's always fun to be back here in class in session tonight. Dean, you are a foreign exchange student tonight, aren't you? I I am. I'm up in the great white north, although it's not, uh, the ground's not white here yet. Feels like the great white north. I'm in uh, central New York. Weather's kind of chilly up here a little bit in the evenings. Yeah, it was a little cooler here today, but it was still in the 80s. That was cooler, though. Yeah, that's a cold front for home. Yeah. Well, it has really been a hot September, so I'm hoping it's going to cool down just a little bit here. Well, we've got a interesting show lined up tonight, a few things to talk about. It's going to be a lot of the same topics that we had covered in the past. What did we talk about last week, Tommy? You can't see the cheat sheet, I know. I sure can't. That's not fair. It, it was, uh, we um, talked about... Uh, it was a month Yagi ago. Yagi antennas? Uh, yeah. I think that was two months ago, maybe. Was it? They all yeah. run together. Yeah, we talked about sky waves. And we talked slept in class. We talked about HF antennas. And guess what we're going to talk about tonight? Um, some more propagation. Some more sky and some more waves. antennas. Yep, and some more antennas, because there's a lot of both. That's and some good stuff, though. It is. It is, and it's stuff that you want to know. Absolutely. Uh, it's probably some stuff I'm probably a little rusty on, so we may be hearing a little buzzing going on tonight. There is a chance we could hear we could hear buzzers coming from two different directions tonight. Uh I don't remember the topics in particular because we did we've done so many shows, but I do remember a couple of buzzers going off last month. I did those did stick with me. Yep. I like the radio up there. There you go. No sleeping in class. I think those last two buzzers were probably on me. They were. That's why I remember them. So I owe you a couple. I usually block the ones out that are on myself. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we we might as well get right on into it because we have a, a few extra questions tonight. We're trying to, to get on through here as quick as we can, yet cover everything thoroughly. So the first question here. Oh, I did want to say, you know, anytime we're streaming live, what else are we doing, Tommy? We're in the chat room. Um, go to amateurlogic.tv uh, forward slash chat. And uh, there's a great group of people in there. They kind of participate as we're going through the question question pool and uh, contributing their answers. And we kind of check up against them. It's a lot of fun in there. Yeah. Yeah, it is. If you're watching a recording, though, there's nobody in the chat room right now. So, well, Yeah, there's probably a few people in there. There's not much activity, though. Yep. <laughs> well, let's get on into the first question, and well, why don't you ask me this one? Okay. All right. Approximately how long is typical sunspot cycle? A, eight minutes. Uh, let's see. B, 40 hours. C, 28 days. Or D, 11 years. Well... I think I know the answer to this one. It's definitely not eight minutes. I mean, that's pretty, you couldn't really hold on a very good many QSOs in eight minutes. Yeah, today, I can't so, talk yeah. that fast. I'm yeah. from the South. It's longer than 40 hours, and it's longer than 28 days. 
Uh, you know, sunspot cycle is something that occurs over a number of years. We've got the uh, solar maximum where we're having the most amount of sunspots, and currently we're in a solar minimum. Uh, sunspot cycles typically are 11 years, so I'm going to say it's D, Tommy, and everybody over in the chat room, uh, they all yeah. know that it's D. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, if you're into radio, that one kind of seems to be sort of common knowledge. People sort of pick up. Yeah. What is the significance of the sunspot number with regard to HF propagation? Is it A, higher sunspot numbers generally indicate a greater probability of good propagation at higher <laughs> frequencies? Uh, B, lower sunspot numbers generally indicate greater probability of sporadic E propagation. C, a zero sunspot number indicates radio propagation is not possible on any band. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Uh, I don't, D's not going to be the answer. I'm sure of that, uh, uh, I'll work my way backwards here. A, a zero sunspot number indicate. No, that's not going to, C's not going to be true because there's always going to be some type of. Yeah. Propagation. Uh, B, lower sunspot numbers in the probability of sporadic E. Or A, higher sunspot numbers generally indicate greater probability of good propagation at higher frequencies. So I'm going to go with A on that one, George. You're That's my final answer. Well, most everybody in the chat room is saying A. I'm going to agree with you, too. Um, we like higher sunspot numbers. So Yeah. Yep. That, and that's kind of another one of those things. If you talk to many people in, in the radio, that's kind of... Uh, sort of a common knowledge or tribal knowledge type thing that uh, people talk about kind of a lot. Yeah. Now, there are, there are other things going on in the sun that um, could make propagation not so well because of the noise that's being generated, but uh, the sunspots are our friends. Yeah, and, uh, and we don't have many right now. No. What does LUF stand for? A, the lowest usable frequency for communication between two points. B, the longest universal function for communications between two points. <laughs> C, the lowest usable frequency during a 24-hour period. Or D, the longest universal function during a 24-hour period. L-U-F. Well, I know that stands for lowest usable frequency. So the question is, is it during a 24-hour period or is it between two points? And I'm going to say it's the lowest usable frequency for communications between two points, A. And I would concur with that. Yeah, everybody in the chat room is saying it's A, so I must be right. Okay, hey, I forgot about this. Oops, can you run around to the other side of the TV? <laughs> this ain't working very well. No, it's not working at all, is it? <laughs> what usually happens to radio waves with frequencies below the LUF? Is it A, they are bent back to Earth? B, they pass through the ionosphere? C, they are completely absorbed by the ionosphere? Or D, they're bent and trapped in the ionosphere to circle the Earth? Does that mean for eternity? Could be. Could be. I don't think that's the answer. Um, what happens to the radio waves with frequencies below the lowest usable frequency? So if it's below the lowest usable frequency, that makes them not usable, right? Uh, um, they're, so uh, yeah. they're not bent back to Earth. So A is not the answer. They either pass through the ionosphere, which is B, or C, they're completely absorbed by the ionosphere. And, let me and just I say, think a while ago we ruled out D was not the answer. I'm thinking the answer is going to be C, Charlie. They are completely absorbed by the ionosphere. Yeah, and there was some mixed answers in the chat room there, so this is a little tougher one. I'm thinking, well, I think we I think we touched base on that some on the lesson I did a couple of months ago. 
I think we must have, because I seem to remember that being the answer, too. So you're saying it's C? So I'm saying it's C. Okay. Well, and you were correct, sir. Look at there. We almost, almost got now it the, right that time. We should get extra credit for that. <laughs> it is kind of <laughs> tough to do it from here to New York. Yeah. Okay. One for me. <laughs> Yes, sir. I got one right here for you. Uh, what happens to the HF propagation when the LUF or low, lowest usable frequency exceeds the maximum usable frequency or the MUF? A, no HF radio frequency will support ordinary skywave communications over the path. B, HF communications over the path are enhanced. C, double hop propagation along the path is more common. R, D, mm -hmm. propagation over the path on all HF frequencies is enhanced. Well, what happens when uh, to HF propagation when the LUF exceeds the MUF? So the lowest usable frequency is higher than the maximum usable frequency. That doesn't even seem like that could happen. That sounds like a negative usable frequency. Yeah. So I know, uh, yeah, they're, they're not enhanced, so it's not D. I don't think it makes double hop propagation along the path more common. It's not C. Uh, it's not B. HF communications over the path are not enhanced. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be A, no HF. Radio frequency will support ordinary skywave communications over the path. Yeah, and that seems to be the one, the only one that really makes any sense, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what most of the folks over in the chat room are saying. There's, there's a little disagreement in there, but uh, yeah, let's see. Yep, that is it. If yeah, I don't see how that would even be possible. So if you've got if the maximum usable frequency is here and the lowest usable frequency is higher than the maximum usable frequency, that seems like that's no usable frequency at all. Yeah, it's almost like you got negative uh -huh. usable frequencies. <laughs> you got a deficit. Why is long distance communications on the 40 meter, 60 meter? 80 meter and 160 meter bands more difficult during the day. Is it A, the F layer absorbs signals at these frequencies during daylight hours? B, the F layer is unstable, unstable during daylight hours. C, the D layer absorbs signals at these frequencies during daylight hours. Or D, the E layer is unstable during daylight hours. Okay, I got to think I got to think back about my lesson here cuz I'm thinking we touched base on some of this too. Not not exactly worded like this. Why is long distance communication on the 40 meter, 60, 80 and 160 meter bands more difficult during the day? During the day, F layer absorbs signals at these frequencies. F layer? No, I don't think that's F layer doesn't do that. F layer is unstable during the daylight hours. I think it, it changes depending on the sun, where the sun is, and everything. The D layer absorbs signals at these frequencies during the daylight hours, or E layer is unstable. I, 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 A doesn't uh, seem really like that's the plausible answer. F, there's a little bit of merit to that, but I'm thinking the real answer is going to be uh, well, C, the D layer absorbs signals at these frequencies during the daylight hours. Well, most people over in the chat room are saying it's C. C. And yeah, I, I think that's right. Uh, I think it's right. Think. Let's see. And it is. You know, I, 
I went back looking for um, uh, the drawings that we'd used on the, the various layers. I was going to flash it up right here so we could talk about it, but uh, don't have it handy. Couldn't couldn't come up with it quickly, but the layers like D, E, and F, the D is the layer closest to the earth down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so you increase in the, the value of the alphabet as you go up. So it's that closest layer to the earth is absorbing those frequencies during the day. Now the, the B, or B, the F layer is unstable during daylight hours. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by unstable because it does change the height depending on if the sun's directly overhead hmm. or um, whatever. So I'm, anyway, that one almost seems plausible, but I, but the D layer, I think, is the culprit here that's stopping us. Here we are, are going to have a guest reader present this one to us tonight. Hi, I am Orny, K5ARN, and this is my question. What type of radio wave propagation allows a signal to be detected at a distance too far for ground wave propagation, but too near for normal sky wave propagation? A. Faraday rotation. B. Scatter. C. Sporadic e-skip. D. Short path skip. That is kind of a tough one, so I'm going to read it again. What type of radio wave propagation allows a signal to be detected at a distance too far from ground wave propagation, but too near for normal sky wave propagation? All right, Faraday rotation. I, I don't think that's... I'm not sure that's a thing, but it is not a thing in this case. Sporadic e-skip. No. That's, um, I don't think that's it, and I don't think it's short path skip. I believe it is scatter, B. And that's what most folks in the chat room are saying. What do you think there, Dean? That, uh, that's probably the one that I would guess at, although I'm not up on my other, like, uh, sporadic E. The characteristics very well on it, so but I, I would think it would be scatter. Well, but I, that's that would be a guess. I'm pretty sure that might be it, though. Well, it was a good guess since you just said it. Yeah. Well, most folks in the chat room there said that it was B. So there were a few dissenters there. So yeah, yeah. some of these propagation ones yeah. can be kind of tough. They sure can. All right. Well, thanks for reading that, Arnie. And yeah, I appreciate that, Arnie. I've, a lot of you are familiar with Arnie. He's the one that, uh, he's probably the biggest fan of the bloopers. And he is in the chat room right now. And, it, you know, he got the answer correct. He did? Now, he must have known. He must have known <laughs> the answer. <laughs> he, he had a little advanced warning on it there. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, he's, he's, he probably knew the answer anyway. Yeah, he probably did. All right, we've got one more question we're going to do before we take a break here. What makes HF scatter signals often sound distorted? Is it A, the ionospheric layer involved is unstable? B, ground waves are absorbing much of the signal? C, the E region is not present. Or D, energy is scattered into the skip zone through several different radio wave paths. All right. That's what makes topic. HF scatter signals sound often sound distorted? Um, the ionosphere layer is unstable. I don't think that's the answer. Ground waves are absorbing much of the signal, and I don't think that would cause it either. E region. The answer's the answer's got to be D. Energy scattered into the skip zone through several different radio wave paths. So I think that's kind of part of the definition of scatter, anyway. Yeah, there's some there's some D's and B's in there. So that is a tough one. I'm gonna go. Yeah, I I, I don't know for sure, but I think that's the one because I think. I'm pretty sure that's uh, what scatter is about. 
similar to that. Yeah. I'll agree with you. And it is D. Energy scattered into the skip zone through several different radio wave paths. So what's going to happen if that energy is scattered around through several different paths? You're probably going to get less where you are. And it's probably going to be varying because of the phase from the different paths arriving at your receiver at different times. So, yeah, you're not, you're not going to get a super clean signal or um, a super steady signal. It's, it's going to kind of be varying. Heard it, worked it, logged it. It's time to get the transceiver that's best suited for your lifestyle. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products. See how you can make the most out of contest season with these transceivers. The competitive edge you've been looking for, raise the bar and hear what others cannot with this flagship HF 50 MHz transceiver, the IC7851. Reciprocal mixing dynamic range, crystal clear local oscillator design, spectrum scope, dual receivers, and digital voice recorder. The IC7610 is the SDR every ham wants and just in time for contesting season. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest signals even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The new ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that will change the world's definition of a SDR transceiver. RF direct sampling, 110 RMDR, independent dual receiver, dual digicell. IC7300 is changing the way entry-level HF is designed. This high-performance innovative HF transceiver with a compact design will far exceed your expectations. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Tell us about that contest, Tommy. Well, if you send your uh, your name in to Ham College at AmateurLogic.tv, you can be entered for the drawing to win a nice ICOM T-shirt and the ICOM ball cap, and you can be one of the best dressed people at the Ham Fest. Yep. And you can look like George there. Yeah. Well, the not, model, my, our model George. Yeah, you may not want to do that. We we need to <laughs> encourage him. It's the the ICOM Ham Crew T-shirt and you always say, Tommy. Yep, you can look just as good coming as you will going. All right. Well, we do have a winner. I All drew right. it before the show here. It is Craig Emmett, W4CME. And he said, Howdy, Professor Thomas and Dean Martin. Love the show. Please enter me in this month's contest for the sweet ICOM swag. Unfortunately for me, you will probably never see this email because the random drawings uh, I ever win is the one for jury duty, but it's harder <laughs> to consider that winning. Well, congratulations, Craig. You are going to look good going into jury duty next time because you're going to be outfitted in the official ham crew t-shirt and hat and you'll have yeah. the other swag to go along with it too so what do you need to put in that email there dean well well you do have to have one piece of information that's really critical you you are required to have a name and you should probably have an email address too or else you can't send an email yeah well i would assume you would have that but yeah you are correct you need an email address to go along with your name um, so send that in to ham college at amateurlogic.tv and you'll be in the drawing. If you sent it in last month or this or this month and you didn't get drawn, uh, send it in again so you can be in the drawing again for next month. Um, so we don't keep them. Uh, the, the list gets cleared out after each time there's a winner and we start over clean. So uh, if you didn't win yet, send your name back in for the next drawing. Yep, Ham College at AmateurLogic.tv. Yep, that'll do it. And uh, hopefully you won't win jury duty either. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> not, but that's kind of the luck I have, I think. Yeah, oh, I hear you. Yeah. All right, back into the questions here. I think, who answered the last one? I think it was you, wasn't it? 
Uh, yes, it was. Well, then, how about you? Ask how about if I one? ask you this one? Okay. Uh, why are HF scatter signals in the skip zone usually weak? A. Only a small part of the signal energy is scattered into the skip zone. B. Signals are scattered from the magnetosphere, which is not a good reflector. Magnetosphere, huh? C. Propagation is through ground waves, which absorb most of the signal energy. R. D. Propagation is through ducts in F region, which absorbs most of the energy. Why are HF scatter signals in the skip zone usually weak? Uh, let's, I'll start at the bottom. D propagation is through ducts in the F region, which absorbs most of the RF energy. No, I don't think that's it. C propagation is through ground wave, which absorbs most of the signal energy. Well, that that's not it either, because the ground wave is not really a skip zone. B, signals are scattered through the magnetosphere, which is not a good reflector. I don't think that's it. We kind of talked about this a little earlier. A, only a small part of the signal energy is scattered into the skip zone because we said, the, you know, the signal energy is, is scattered throughout and only a mm -hmm. small part of it makes it into the skip zone, I believe. So I'm, I'm going to say it's A. There's some disagreement in the chat room there on that. What do you think? I, I think it's A. I don't think it's B because I think Magnetosphere was the bad guy on the X-Men. Do you think that, that was the guy with the big M on his cape? That's right. It is A. Only a small part of the signal energy is scattered into the skip zone. So the rest of it is scattered somewhere that it... Yeah, here we go. You left me hanging, man. There you go. <laughs> I thought you were trying to show me what time it was. I just, <laughs> I, I forgot all about it. <laughs> all right, well, I got another one for you. What is a characteristic of HF scatter signal? A, they have high intelligibility. B, they have a wavering sound. C, they have very large swings in signal strength. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Okay, this was going to be a, this is going to be a guesser here. A, they have high intelligibility. Well, we just said earlier that they could be distorted, so I don't think A is going to be an answer. I'm scratching that one off the list. Because I'm scratching that one off the list, I have to scratch D off the list. Yep. Which is going to bring me down to B and C. They have a wavering sound, which I think I think that could be possible because of the scattering. Uh, C, they have very large swings in signal strength. I, I, I think I'm going to go with B because we had mentioned... Uh, Mentioned something similar to that on a previous question. Uh, they have a wavering sound, um, so I know they can be. There could be some multi multi path effect um, on the receiving end of that. So you're saying it's B? And I'm thinking that I'm going to go with the B. Uh, they have a wavering sound. Well, we we got some mixed answers over in the chat room there. I, but I'm 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 actually totally guessing here. I really don't know. I'm gonna go with B. I think it's a good guess. And it is. Which of the following might be an indication that signals heard on the HF bands are being received via scatter propagation? A. The communication is during a sunspot maximum. B. The communication is during a southern ionospheric disturbance. C. The signal is heard on a frequency below the maximum usable frequency. Or D. The signal is heard on a frequency above the maximum usable frequency. Boy, this is a uh, tough one. I am so glad you got this one. Which of the following might be an indication that signals heard on the HF banner are being received via scatter propagation? 
The communication is during a sunspot maximum. Well, I don't think that's it at all. Because uh, sunspots are, are good for us. We wouldn't need scatter for propagation. The communication is during a sudden, sudden ionospheric disturbance. Maybe. See, the signal is heard on a frequency below the maximum usable frequency. Well, any typically any signal you hear is <clears throat> going to be below the maximum usable frequency. So I don't uh -huh. think that would lend it to be uh, scatter. Or D, the signal is heard on a frequency above the maximum usable frequency. That's a possibility. I'm going to say it's B or D. That's, that is, we could have a buzzer right here. I'm going to say it's a D, the signal is heard on a frequency above the maximum usable frequency. Above? Yep. Yep. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yep. Maybe. I, I, I don't know the answer to this one. Well, there's a lot of folks. That sounds plausible, though. There's some of the of the guesses in the chat room. Most of them are saying that, although there are some dissenters in there as well. Well, there's no A's in there, so. No. Okay. Signal is heard on a frequency above the maximum usable frequency. Well, All I'm right. just glad that one was yours. Well, I'm just glad I gave you the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of the reason, the way I, I reason that out is, well, that's a good question. I, I narrowed it down to either B or D. And I was thinking maybe a southern atmospheric disturbance could cause it. But then again, if the signal is above the maximum usable frequency, then I'm thinking, yeah, that could be some scatter occurring up there because we had talked earlier about how the scatter, you know, could occur when really you, you don't have good propagation at all. So mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't have good propagation above the maximum usable frequency. So that was my, my logic for that guess. Yeah, I, I didn't even really think about that one. So, I, like I said, I'm glad you got that one because that's not one I would have picked. Well, let me see if I can get you back then. Okay. How might a skywave signal sound if it arrives at your receiver by both short path and long path propagation? A, periodic fading approximately every 10 minutes. Or, excuse me, every 10 seconds. B, signal strength increased by 3 dB. C, the signal strength may be counseled, causing severe attenuation. Or D, a well-defined echo might be heard. How might a sky... I have to read it again just to make sure I understand it. How might a sky wave signal sound if it arrives at your receiver by... Oh, okay. By both short path and long path propagation. What is short path and long path? Well, one's, one's uh, basically taking the long, <laughs> just like, just what it says. It's going to take the long way around or the short or the most direct path. So one goes straight to you and the other one goes the all the way other around one's the world. Gonna go around. Yep. So the time, there's going to be a timing difference there by the time it gets to you, even though it travels at the speed of light, um, because of the distance, a well-defined echo could be heard from that. So B, D is the only one that really makes any sense to that one to me, to mom. Yeah. Because oh. we got a clear clear case of multipath right there. Now I'm going to agree with that with everybody saying D over in the chat room. There you go. A well-defined echo might be heard. Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Next. How how is a directional antenna pointed when making a long path contact with another station? A toward the rising sun. B along the gray line. C one head one hundred and eighty degrees from its short path heading. 
or D, toward the north. Yeah, we just talked about this one. Yep. How is the directional antenna pointed when making a long path contact with another station? Well, you turn it exactly 180 degrees opposite of, of the short path. So I'm going to say it's C. That's the only mm -hmm. one that really I would agree with sense. that. Everybody's it's basically going to go the long way around, basically around the world to get, mm -hmm. get Every, across the street. Everybody's saying C over there, so I must be right. Yeah. Pretty interesting, uh, interesting stuff. It is. It's amazing. All right. Well, I got one for you then. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. No, no. I messed up, didn't I? I'll take this one. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, your, it's your turn. So um, I, I, I have a good feeling that you're going to get this one right. <laughs> <laughs> which of the following <laughs> which of the following describes an asmuthal projection map a a map that shows accurate land masses uh, b a map that shows true bearings and distances from a particular location c a map that shows the angle at which an amateur satellite crosses the equator or D, a map that shows the number of degrees longitude that an amateur satellite appears to move westward at the equator with each orbit. That's a mouthful. Yep. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to go with B on this one. <laughs> what's your, uh, since what's your reason? Since I saw the answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, a map that shows true bearings and distances from a particular location. So, um, the, an azimuth map, I don't know that I've actually ever seen one, but apparently it's got the, uh, the coordinates on it, uh, latitude, longitude and everything. It's some measurements. I kind of feel like you're going to be seeing one here real quick. Yeah. I got a, got a feeling I probably will too, which is a handy thing. I, I'm not sure that I would have gotten this one right. Well, I accidentally flashed the answer on the screen before we read yeah, the question. They, I'm sure they saw that. Yeah. There you go. And this I'm, I'm sorry to y'all watching along who were expecting a buzzer. I, I blew it. This would have one. been it. You could probably go ahead and hit the buzzer now anyway. Okay. All right. I, I said we, you might see an azimuthal projection map here real soon. How about right now? Sounds like perfect timing. All right. Well, this is not one. No. This This is just a map of the globe right here. And you can see it's stretched out there just like um, most of the maps that you see. And you were thinking, well, let's see. We want to make a contact over to the uh, tip of the boot of Italy. If we were going to do that, we would think you just point due east there. And that's going to put you right there. Looks like it. It looks like it. So that's the way we would point our antenna. If we looked at this on an azimuthal projection map, though, this is what it looks like. You've, like, taken the earth and flattened it out there. Looking Columbus down, style. Looking down from the top. If we pointed our antenna due east, look at we're going to miss Italy altogether. To point at the tip of the boot of Italy, we'd actually need to point it up here, so which would be more northerly. So we're getting a true bearing in distance by looking at this on an azimuthal projection map, where the the regular globe map wouldn't have shown us this angle. That's interesting. Yep. Kind of messes with your head a little bit, too. Boy, it does, doesn't it? And you don't see those real often. You, you will occasionally, but you'll have to look for it to find one of those. The, you know, the first place I ever saw one was where? hanging hanging on the wall of the ham shack at the ICOM headquarters out in Washington. Oh, yeah? Yep. They had one hanging up there, and Ray explained to me what it was. So well, that's cool. Yeah. So that, that is pretty cool right there. All right. If I uh, had a beam, I'd definitely get one of those put on the wall. It could be quite handy. Mm-hmm. 
Well, we've still got more questions to go, but I, I think everybody's about ready for a little break right here. Are you new to the ham world or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level? Study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. Hamstudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbean, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org, powered by ICOM, for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. Hungry? Thirsty? The refreshment stand is open with everything to satisfy your taste buds. Here's the menu, the hottest, freshest, crunchiest popcorn. Each kernel popped to its fullest with that real movie time taste. Cold drinks. You'll find your favorite ice cold, tasty, and thirst quenching. And hot dogs, hamburgers, and candy, too. Now a short intermission, so you'll have time to make your selection before the show begins. A one, a two, a three, four, five, a six. Six! Six! Surprise! It's Six Finger! It looks like your finger, but watch him flip. It's a secret weapon at your fingertip. Just point and fire. Six Finger sends an SOS missile to your friends. Six Finger! Six Finger! Six Finger! Fires cap loaded bombs and they explode as a ballpoint pen and signals in code. Looks like a finger so no one can see who has six finger. Me! 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 Shoots rockets that burst and bombs that explode and writes with a pen and Signals in code, shoot message missiles and watch them go. And it looks like your finger and how will they know? Six finger, six finger, six finger. Here's how to get it on the card right there. Less than two dollars everywhere. Six finger, six finger, man alive. How did I ever get along with five? Atari introduces the woman of the year, Ms. Pac-Man. With a style of entertainment that Pac-Man never knew, an endless supply of floating goodies, oranges, pretzels, four different screens, each with different exits and entrances, and the green screen so difficult to reach, you may never see it again. Don't you know, I'm more than Pac-Man with a bow. Reach for Ms. Pac-Man. Reach, reach, reach for Atari. New from RCA Victor, handiest TV set ever built. RCA Victor personal TV, light enough to take anywhere. Wonderful. What's that? A detachable stand. Tilts for easy viewing. How's the picture? Sharp, clear. It's RCA Victor picture quality. Where's the antenna? It's hiding here. And there's even a connection for an outside antenna if needed. Make RCA Victor's new personal TV your very own set. Keep it in your bedroom. Watch the shows you want to see. Or use it in your office. Watch important newscasts, ball games. In your kitchen, anywhere in your home. Also ideal as a second set. What's it cost? Lowest priced RCA Victor ever. Only $125 in three modern colors. Pick it up at your RCA Victor dealer. RCA Victor salutes National Radio Week, May 13th through May 19th. See your RCA Victor dealer. These two portable radios are about to be dropped. Watch this daring crash test. This case completely demolished. 
But RCA Victor's non-breakable impact case doesn't have a scratch, chip, or dent. So tough, it's guaranteed for five full years by RCA Victor. No chipping, no cracking, no breaking. RCA Victor gives you a complete line of new portables, all completely restyled. Here's another RCA Victor exclusive. Twist this new wavefinder antenna. Pull in your favorite stations loud and clear. Only RCA Victor portables have the non-breakable impact case, as low as $29.95 at your RCA Victor dealers. I ran up to the Ronco store while uh, <laughs> we were on break. Yeah. <laughs> you better look out. You put an eye out with that thing. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. I don't remember that. I don't remember that either. <laughs> Must have not been on the market very long. <laughs> Next question. What is meant by the term DBI and DVD when referring to antenna gain? Is it A, DBI refers to an isotropic antenna and DVD refers to a dipole antenna? B, DBI refers to an ionospheric reflecting antenna or DBD refers to a dissipative Antenna. Or D, DBI refers to... C. Wait, C. Or C, DBI refers to an inverted V antenna. DBD refers to a downward reflecting antenna. Or D, DBI refers to an isometric antenna. DBD refers to a discone antenna. I, I don't think this cone's got its own designator there, so I don't think it's going to be D. Downward reflecting antenna. Inverted V. I don't think it's going to be C either, because DBI is not going to be for inverted V. Ionospheric reflecting antenna. I've never even heard of an ionospheric reflecting antenna. It's going to be a DBI refers to an isotropic antenna. DBD refers to a dipole antenna. I think I think I'm gonna go with A. You're gonna the go other with ones a. don't seem to make any sense. Well, most of the folks. Are, well, everybody in the chat room who guessed on this one said it was A. I'm inclined to agree. It is A. DBI refers to an isotropic antenna, and DBD refers to a dipole antenna. Well, we know what a dipole antenna is before because we've talked about those. The length of a dipole antenna, if it's a quarter-wave dipole, how long do you think it'll be? It depends on the, length, the frequency that it was cut for, to be resonant for. Well, it would be a quarter-wave, though. Yeah, it would be a quarter wave of whatever the frequency is. Yeah, and if it's a half wave dipole, then guess what? <laughs> be twice as long as the quarter wave. Well, you see where I'm going then. Yeah, it um, varies. So, so yeah, you know, a quarter wave dipole is pretty much um, unbalanced antenna. You'd, you'd have maybe a vertical ra uh, radiator there, and then you'd have some ground elements coming out of it and or a counterpoise you'd actually call it a half wave you would have and i don't have two ink pencils right here but but you would have like uh, here i got a sharpie you'd have like two elements each one would be a quarter wave and you'd you'd feed it balanced so anyway those are dipole antennas what an isotropic antenna would be or an isotropic radiator would be like, uh, I think it's like a, maybe a perfect antenna located out in space where, you know, there's no, nothing interfering with it. There is no such thing as an isotropic radiator. It's a, um, it's an imaginary antenna. And when we're talking about dB or decibels, a decibel, you got to have a, it's a reference to something else. Um, 
I'm trying to think of how to explain that. One decibel by itself doesn't mean anything. It's got to be referenced to something else. So if I told you we're going to do something in one hour, you'd have to look at your watch and see, see what time it is now. That would be your reference, and you'd know you'd add 60 minutes to that, and that's the time I'm talking about. Right. All right. Well, when we're talking about a decibel, it's it's reference to a certain level. All right. So if we're talking about an isotropic antenna, then the radiated power off of it we would call zero dB. Anything below that would be a negative dB number. Anything above that would be a positive dB number, and it's a, a law of the rhythmic ratio. So. A DBI or, or an isotropic antenna is going to have a certain gain. A dipole antenna is actually going to have 2.15 dB more gain than an isotropic radiator. So that's, and this is not on the question pool here. You know, actually, I probably shouldn't have explained this right now because I see it's going to be on the next question. But God, I hope that was mine. No, I think you just uh, you just answered the one we were just doing, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. Well, then this one will be mine. Uh, okay. So so anyway, well, let's just see the next question here. We'll ex we'll try to explain it from there if we need to. How does antenna gain stated in DBI compare to gain stated in DBD for the same antenna? A, DBI gain figures are 2.15 dB higher, I'm sorry, lower than DBD gain figures. B, DBI gain figures are 2.15 dB higher than DBD gain figures. C, DBI gain figures are the same as the square root of DBD gain figures multiplied by 2.15. RD, DBI gain figures are the reciprocal of DBD gain figures plus 2.15 dB. Okay, well, we can knock out those last two there. It's definitely not C or D. So it's either going to be A or B. And you got to kind of wrap your head around it to make sense. I said that the gain of a dipole as compared to an isotropic antenna, the dipole will be 2.15 dB higher. The dBi gain figures are 2.15 dB higher than dbd gain figures or the dbi gain figures are 2.15 db lower than the dbd gain figures that's really hard to wrap your head around isn't it uh-huh it sounds like they're saying the same thing no it doesn't it was opposites yeah so how does the gain stated in dbi compared to the gain stated in dbd for the same antenna. All right, so if it's stated in DBI, I'm gonna say B. This is really confusing to think about, but I believe the answer is- So you're saying it's B? I'm saying it's B. I know it sounds backwards, doesn't it? It seems backwards. Yeah, it does, but let's just see. Um, yeah, they're kind of confused out in the chat room, too. Most folks are saying it's A, and you would think right off it's A. In fact, it's B. Okay. So how do, how do I explain that? That's, Good question. That's some tough explaining to do there. You got, some, you got some explaining to do. All right. If I wanted to have an isotropic antenna and a dipole antenna that both had the same output, the figure on the isotropic antenna would have to be 2.15 dB higher to match the same output you're getting out of the dipole. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. 
And it does. The question doesn't state it that way, but that's what they're trying to say there. So, does that even make sense now? <laughs> uh, it makes sense. It's hard to think about, though, isn't it? Yeah. I need some Tylenol now. <laughs> but so yeah, that, it makes sense. Yeah. To have them both put out the same amount of power, the, the gain figures of the DBI one would have to be increased 2.15 dB to equal the same amount of output. Yeah, I don't understand why they wouldn't use a common measuring reference, though. Well, they, yeah, and you can use either one. I mean, you'll see antennas rated in either DBI or DBD, and you need to know which one of those, That it, if it just says it's got a 5 dB gain, that don't tell you anything. you got to know if right. it's isotropic or over a dipole. Let's show you what a quad antenna is. A quad antenna uh, looks like this. You know, my f yep. my first base station antenna was one of these. Now, that's a four-element quad right there. Uh, I had an eight-element one for two meters. Oh, wow. Yeah. Remember I remember you had that antenna up there. I couldn't remember how many elements it was. Yeah, I had it mounted in the top of a pine tree. It was about 70 feet tall. And it worked like a champ, except when the wind blew, you'd experience some fading because you were slinging your signal around. <laughs> <laughs> you were changing the angle of radiation. That's what a quad antenna looks like. Or, you know, they also, you can have them for HF. Probably wouldn't have a four element, though. For, you know, that'd be pretty big for HF. But anyway... How does the forward gain of a two-element quad antenna compare to the forward gain of a three-element Yagi antenna? A, it's about two-thirds as much. B, about the same. C, about 1.5 times as much. Or D, about twice as much. Okay, how does the forward gain of a two-element quad antenna Compared to the forward gain of a three element Yankee. So the two element quad, the less elements, I think the less gain. And I think the quad antenna by tip is gonna have a tighter a tighter pattern than the Yagi. I think. So what would be the advantage of that? Huh? What would be the advantage of that? Well, you got more signal rejection from the back, and your, uh, I guess your angle of radiation is a lot tighter, so you have more gain forward, going, you know, forward where the antenna's uh, pointed. Um, two element quad and a three element Yagi. The Yagi is not going to have quite the gain, I think. Watch this. I'm, I'm thinking they're going to be close to the same because the characteristic of the quad, if I remember right, has more gain than the Yagi does, but you've got more elements on the Yagi so, than the quad. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking they're going to be close to the same. I'm guessing. I, I'm not totally sure, though. But that makes kind of sense to me. Well, let's see. Uh, they're a little mixed on it in the chat room there. Some of them are going with you, saying it's about the same. That's what I would say. It's okay. about the same. The, uh, the gain of the quad is just a little bit higher, so it only takes two elements of it to be about the same as a three-element Yagi. Yeah, that's kind of what, the way I was kind of thinking of it. Yeah. I don't really know what the gain, the typical gains of those would be, but it uh, seems like they should be about the same. Yeah. Approximately, how long is each side of the driven element of a quad antenna? A, one quarter wavelength. B, one half wavelength. C, three quarters wavelength. Or D, one wavelength. Hmm. Approximately how long is each side of the driven element of a quad antenna? 
Well, if we look at our quad antenna there, you can see one element's got the coax connected to it. That's the driven element. It's got four sides to it. That's actually a full wave loop. That's what that driven element is right there. Based on that, uh, I'd say each side of that's got to be a quarter wavelength. Okay. So that means it's, the answer is going to be A, a quarter wavelength. And that's what they're saying over in the chat room as well. What do you think? I think that's right. Well, let's see. A, quarter wavelength. So only a few left to go here. And, uh, well, I'll ask you this one, of course, since it's your turn. Okay. Approximately how long is each side of the reflector element of a quad antenna? A, slightly less than a quarter wavelength. B, slightly more than a quarter wavelength. C, slightly less than a half wavelength. Or D, slightly more than half wavelength. Okay, how, approximately, how long is each side of the reflector element of a quad antenna? So if we think back about when I brought the Yagi, the tape measure Yagi back a few months ago and we talked about the elements on there, we had the driven element, the reflector element was the larger one that was in the back. Um, the, well, just sitting in too long, the reflector element was the longer one. So I'm thinking it's going to be B, slightly more than the quarter wavelength because it, the reflector should be larger, longer mm -hmm. typically than, well, not typically, every case that I know of than the driven element. And the driven element was a quarter based off of your last answer. So it's going to be B, slightly more than a quarter wavelength. I'll, uh, I'll concur and... Most folks are, are saying B over in the chat room. And it is slightly more than a quarter wavelength. What configuration of the loops of a two-element quad antenna must be used for the antenna to operate as a beam antenna, assuming one of the elements is used as a reflector? A, the driven element must be fed with a ballon transformer. B, there must be an open circuit in the driven element at the point opposite to the feed point. C, the reflector element must be approximately 5% shorter than the driven element. Or D, the reflector element must be approximately 5% longer than the driven element. What configurations of the loop of a two-element quad antenna must be used for the antenna to operate as a beam antenna, assuming one of the elements is used as a reflector. A two-element quad. All right, the one about there must be an open circuit in the driven element, B. That's not it. Uh, so let's see, A, the driven element must be fed with a ballon transformer. No, and we just looked at a quad. It didn't have a ballon on it. Uh, see, the reflector element must be approximately 5% shorter. No, the reflector is always a little bigger. So D, the reflector element must be approximately 5% longer than the driven element. I'm going to say it's D. I, I would concur with that. Yeah, uh, that's, that's what makes sense to me. That's what everybody's saying over in the chat room. So Yeah, that kind of supports the last question and answer, too. Yeah. So it is D. The reflector element must be approximately 5% longer. Nice job. What happens when the feed point of a quad antenna of any shape is moved from the midpoint to the top or bottom of the midpoint of either side? A, the polarization of the irradiated signal changes from horizontal to vertical. B, the polarization of the radiated signal changes from vertical to horizontal. C, there is no change in polarization. D, the radiated signal becomes circularly polarized. Okay, 
Here we go. I'll try to read that again to make sure that I got that clear in my head. What happens when the feed point of a quad antenna of any shape is moved from the midpoint of the top or bottom midpoint? From the midpoint of the top or bottom to the midpoint of either side. So if it's being fed from the top or bottom, I'm thinking that's going to be vertically polarized. So it's going to go to the side, then that's going to be horizontal polarized. So it's not C, it's not D. I think it's going to be B. The polarization of the radiated signal changes from vertical to horizontal, from the top to the bottom to the side. Yeah, it's going to be B. The polarization of the radiated signal changes from vertical to horizontal. All right, so let's see. the. This was yours to answer, so I'm going to be silent until we see what the real answer is. It's A. What was that sound? That's tough, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I tell you what, let's figure out for sure. We'll go to the Bible here. Okay. Gordon West Amateur Radio <laughs> well, it's Study prob Guide. It's probably got to be, uh, what you got on there is probably right. I yeah. just uh, like to know why. I'm, I must be looking at it wrong. Let's see if, if Gordo can explain it where we can understand it. Chat room had uh, kind of mixed responses yeah, as well. That's what I'm saying. This was a tough one. Gordo says, What a work of art. You built your own cubicle quad antenna for the band of your choice. If you feed coax cable to the center of a horizontal side, the signal will be horizontally polarized. Well, that's kind of what I was thinking. If you decide to feed the quad from the center of the vertical side, guess what? The signal will leave the antenna vertically polarized. With all this work of changing from horizontal to vertical, make any big differences in sky wave? Probably not. Not in sky wave, but if you're using it for VHF or UHF, it'll make a big difference. You were thinking about it backwards there. I'm not going to say whether or not I was agreeing with you or not. <laughs> <laughs> just out of courtesy you know oh let's yeah. nice. appreciate that <laughs> all right well that is all the questions for tonight we're going to be right back and we're going to tell you how you could win this radio package that's sitting right here in front of us so so don't all go right. away Around the 15th of each month, it's Amateur Radio's original and longest-running video podcast, AmateurLogic.tv, with hosts George Thomas, Tommy Martin, and Emil Diodine. Roughly, here's what I have. The bottom trace here is ground. While the elements will jiggle some, they're actually not too bad. It's light. After putting it together, I decided to test everything, so I ran in 12 volts, and I'm measuring the output here. No, it's not too windy right now, Jim. It was yesterday. We're in the antenna switching matrix. Any one of our six broadcast transmitters could be connected to any of the 22 antennas. I personally am so thrilled that George got the special award. Well deserved, my friend. That's really cool. Yeah, what about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl or were you at home uh, operating that night? Tune in my amplifier and... Oh, I lost power in the shack and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about yeah. 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, huh. that explains a lot. And yeah, we can take this and put it over inside our box. It's flush to the bottom. If we were to rotate, we can see that thing goes all the way through. So we'll have a hole in the bottom. Here's what it looks like after I've got them all soldered together and the heat shrinked up. Okay, let's give it a try and see how it worked out. So there you have it, the hula loop. No, you can't null out the dogs barking. I have two thin film solar cells to run this. Looks like a little mini weather satellite, actually. And uh, I'm using a guitar string for the antennas. 
I particularly like that last one there, twenty nine ninety nine. You can get a fifty foot garden hose extension cord combo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Do if, not get cord wet. Now most of these J poles are built with metal elements or tubing. Uh, the reason I chose wire for this one is the length of this particular one. So I wanted to hang it from the tree so I can hoist it up there. Yeah. Go fishing. Well, we, we couldn't find the reel. <laughs> yeah. Is that what yeah. that is? All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. We're going to be having a contest. You know, the, every year for the last few years, we've given away a, a radio package, and uh, this year is going to be no different. Yep. So, yeah, very, very nice one. Yep. Uh, yeah, it really is. Uh, what is the main part of the prize package here, Tommy? Uh, the main thing, we've got an ICOM IC7300 transceiver from ICOM. And that's a software-defined radio. It's not just um, not just an entry-level radio, although it's at an entry-level price. It's got color touch green on it. It's great DSP noise reduction. Uh, very good RMDR and phase noise characteristics. 15 discrete bandpass filters. What that means is those are actually... Um, well, I guess like analog filters, they're, they're not done in software. There are actually physically 15 filters in there for band passing, which, which helps out the radio. Uh, 4.3 inch color touch green real-time spectrum scope. It has a built-in antenna tuner, 101 memory channels. It's got a SD memory card slot on the front there for saving data. Multifunction meter. Uh, does all the CW, single sideband, RIDI, AM and FM modes. Uh, great, great radio. Of course, you're going to need some power for that. Well, how are we going to power it, Tommy? Well, it just so happened to be including a nice MFJ 4230 DMP 12-volt 30-amp power supply. And that's a super compact 30-amp Monty Light power supply with a digital voltmeter and ammeter, five-way bonding post. A pair of Anderson power poles. Uh, it does 25 amps continuously or 30 amp surge, and you can adjust the voltage there anywhere from 4 to 16 volts. And it'll operate on uh, either 120 or 240 volts from 47 to 63 hertz. And, yep. well, we're probably going to want to, I guess, hook this to an antenna, huh? Yeah, we're going to need an antenna. So how about an MFJ 2286 big stick antenna? The big stick antenna right here. It's a 17-foot telescopic uh, mast. Uh, it collapses. How short does that thing collapse down to? 28 inches in just seconds. It really does. It extends really mm -hmm. quick. It's got a loading coil here at the bottom that's tappable. So this antenna is covers what bands, Tommy? Um, that's a good question. I don't have the document in front of me. Well, it's uh, 40 meters up through 6 meters. So it gives you most HF plus 6 meters there. Um, comes with a ground counterpoise as well, and it's got a, uh, a pipe mount here for uh, mounting it to a pipe or uh, tripod or whatever you've got. I will say that thing does work really well. Vince used that uh, mm -hmm. at field day a couple of years ago off the back of his car and made quite a few contacts with it. It, it works very well. I was talking with my son here um, a few weeks back about his antenna situation. He's in a neighborhood where he can't put up an outside antenna, and we were talking about that right there. He may give one of these a try. Yeah. Of course, you're going to need a way to hook that to the radio here. What what have you got for that? Yeah, so we're probably going to need some coax, aren't we? How about 50 feet of RG8X coax from MFJ? And it's American-made. Comes with the connectors already installed. Um, and, of course, the radio comes with a microphone. But what if you want a little upgrade there? What would you use? Well, there's a uh, Heil ICM microphone included with it. Uh, very, very nice radio. Compliments a Heil sound. A uh, very nice microphone for earlier model ICOM radios. Got a push-to-talk button built on it. 
Mic Connect is already installed to fit ICOM rigs, and uh, it's a let's read element in there, so it's it's uh, designed to give a little more output than a standard dynamic microphone would. And not to stop short there, what if you want to operate emergency communications or contesting or, you know, do something like that? Well, we've got a, a nice uh, Heil BM-17 headset. Yeah. You know, and, I feel... Uh, as long as I don't get that thing and take it home before the contest is over. You know, I feel kind of like Jay on Let's Make a Deal. <laughs> it's, it's a Heil BM-17 headset here. This one has uh, the dual ear pieces on it. So you've got audio on both sides, although they make one as well with a single ear piece on it. It has either an electric or a dynamic element available. Very flexible uh, boom right there. These things are lightweight and very comfortable. I've tried it out. They sound great. Uh, you're not going to lose them easily with the bright yet uh, yellow color here. And it comes with the uh, adapter cable to fit an ICOM rig. So uh, uh, a great pair of microphones and headset there to go with yep. this rig. And uh, what? Well, we've got something else. And we were just referring to this here a few moments ago. Yeah, Gordon West License Study Guides. Got either the uh, general class or the extra class. Uh, your choice. Uh, Gordo's going to give you one of those, and that'll help you upgrade. If you're a technician, you're going to want to be at least a general so you can get on the air with this radio. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're a general, why not upgrade to extra? Gordo's got all the study material in there, not just the questions and the answers, but also the explanations of all those topics as well, and a lot more. So thanks, uh, Gordon West Radio School and W5YI for supplying those. And then one final prize there to go along with this. You're not finding that on the list, are you? Nope, they're not on the list. But I heard them jingling, so I moved the document out of the way. I knew what they were. Some of the private stash of the faux gold PL259s. Not to be used for any RF uh, uses. Well, these fine commemorative uh, gold, faux gold PL259s here are a real thing of beauty. Uh, I believe <laughs> you can find some, some earrings, possibly a nose ring has been constructed out of these before. Did you ever get that done? No. No. You'll have to get back to it. I th this is my final pair. I think you've got maybe, what, two or three left? Yeah, I've got a few left. Okay. You'll have to get back on that nose ring project. That'd make a great segment for the 13th anniversary. And for all the official contest rules and regulations and uh, uh, exactly the explanation of what you need to include in your email, before you send your email, just go check at amateurlogic.tv slash contest there's a link at the bottom of your screen right there get all the details right there and we want to thank icom america mfj enterprises howl sound and gordon west radio schools for making this possible well tommy we've had a full show again tonight uh as i look we have. Over it's here. been fun yeah. except for that last buzzer at the end that was the best part everybody was <laughs> waiting for that yeah and, and there look. you go. And Emil was there. That was for you, Emil. Yep. And the bloopers and the two or three times the live stream dropped, that was for you, Arnie. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Arnie, for uh, being the reader this, this month. Yep. Really appreciate you doing that. And uh, thanks to all our friends in the chat room for feeding us the answers. Let me just say, you guys weren't right every time, but then neither were we. So no. <laughs> it kind of works out. But, uh yeah, uh, I've got uh, I've got one thing I wanted to say if I if I have just a second. No, no. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So you can have two. Um, Ar Arnie did the guest reader this time, and uh, we need some others to step up. If you want to be a guest reader, send me an email, Tommy at amateurlogic.tv, and uh, we'll get with you and uh, 
you can send in just a short video if you want to do it, and I'll send you the question and answers, read them and uh, record them. Send me a short video clip, and we can put you on the show as a guest reader. Absolutely. We, we like having the guest readers on there. It gives us a moment to breathe and plus see some of the faces of, uh, you know, some of our friends here on the show. Yeah, th thanks to uh, Marty and Kelly for the suggestion on that. It was a great idea. Yeah. And uh, Kelly was the first one to do it. Um, so this is uh, three months we've had guest readers. So let's keep it going. And uh, you want to do it, send me an uh, email. And we'll, we'll get it put together. Yep. All right. Well, before we get out of here, we want to mention, uh, well, a couple of things. We always mention our social media sites. You know, we get a lot of ideas from you guys in there. And uh, uh, generally, just have a good time visiting with you. Uh, well, we've got a Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash amateurlogic.tv. Uh, uh, we've got a Google Plus community, and it's at that link right there. Yep, and we're on Twitter at Amateur Logic and at Ham College. And we're also on uh, Instagram, although there's not a lot going on on there. Uh, mostly that's for when we go to HamFest, things like that. But uh, Amateur Logic account for the Instagram. Yep, and if you're wondering uh, what was in the shows, well, our friend Dan in on LVS does the uh, wiki for us for both Amateur Logic and Ham College. It's uh, amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. And with that, uh, Dean Martin, where, where to next? Will you be sitting right here, or will you be... Uh, sitting in this little box beside me next month for the next for the next ham college i'll i'll be in town okay All um right. so we actually uh my next uh, go live for our software is actually in jackson so i'll be home for a few weeks during oh, that wow. part right at home yeah you know it would have been nice if they had started here huh <laughs> yeah would have been good <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being here with us tonight, everyone. And um, thanks for supporting Ham College and Amateur Logic. Uh, you know, we wouldn't do it if it wasn't for you guys. So. Yep, absolutely. And we will see you when? What do, I don't know if we got a date for the next Amateur Logic. Is it? Uh, no, sometime, sometime right before the 15th yep. of October. Yep. It'll be that that week and um, probably well, I hadn't I can't see a calendar from here but yeah it's going to be the Friday or Saturday night right after August the 11th I would imagine October the 11th uh, October the 11th I don't um, know if we better take a hiatus to August again we we tried that one time almost never made it back True. From it. Yeah, that was the long summer break, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. That was that episode. All right. 7-3, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. And, uh, hey, join us back here soon. Yep, 7-3, everybody. Appreciate y'all. sunspot numbers generally indicate a greater probability of good propagation well I guess tell us. yeah hmm? uh, yeah I guess hmm. you can tell something didn't go as I expected there okay that's never happened before <laughs> uh, how long is a dipole antenna Tommy uh, about as long as a piece of wire that's one way to say it. If it's a quarter wave dipole, it's a quarter wave long. If it's a half wave dipole, guess what it is? You look like I've stumped you completely. Hello?